very good morning ladies and gentlemen it's pleasure to see you in warm afternoon see every day you know when we get up we feel you know there is a new hope an edge of sunrise and we feel that it's going to be a better day yes it's a god's gift <laughs> Please unmute uh, yourself. Friends, surprisingly, this notion is getting embedded to all business talks nowadays. We have never experienced so many challenges and uncertainty as being witnessed during current year 2020. Be it pandemic, new norm of working from home, unlearning experience learning new norms of life huge swing in oil pricing all projection suddenly changing to sos mode upcoming multiple regulations and finally brexit deal happened last week we are filled with multiple questions as well as fire in our belly to write this tie we have been feeling a dire need to update ourselves and we are thankful to the speakers who have accepted our invitation at short notice and i'm sure this is going to ignite a dire need and multiple silver lining may come out from today's discussion friends sibn saudi indian business network has been always front runner to bring about updated knowledge to business community the organization is supported by volunteers like us part of our csr activity this works under patronage of indian ambassador his excellency dr ausab said who really has conceived this child during his tenure as consul general in year 2004 and recently he has taken a new responsibility as ambassador has relaunched sibn with nation wise network we are going to arrange multiple business events covering b2b uh, meetings trade delegations and professional learning sessions which are need of our based on uh, suggestion from our members i am sure you will find it valuable having our to hear learned speaker i am thankful to speakers as well as my team colleague A special thanks to ms hamna mariam Energy Council, Commerce and PIC, MS Insa, Amjad Sarif, Jakaria Biladi, Gajan Prajaki, Mr. Raju Jirab, my friends who has worked hours and hours from their personal time to bring out this event. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you again to the saga of business, and let's hear our keynote speaker for the today, Mr. T. V. Mohan Das. May I have his slide, please? Uh, okay, next slide. Yep. Yeah. Friends, Mr. Mohan Das doesn't require introduction. He has headed Infosys, world's uh, and India's one of the largest uh, IT company, as board of director. After that, today he is holding multiple chairman position with new startup. capital financing company he is also chairman of manipal group of education society he is also known as a very good philanthropist for his efforts to help society i will not take much of time because we want to hear his thoughts over global economy how it's moving and what is there for us to project how it looks 2021 which is the question <coughs> to, uh, to all of us Let's welcome Mr. Mohan Das Bai, sir. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, post-COVID-19 new normal for India and the world. Next, please. Well, we must understand that COVID-19 was something the world has not seen for the last hundred years. Even in the First World War, 16 million people died. Second World War, 60 million people died. But in terms of the geographical area not such a large part of the world was affected the war was in certain parts of the world which we know but this time more than 150 countries have been impacted and the fear has been there 
and across the world most economies had to shut down even during the war we are not seeing them shutting down and you see that the cases are now going up close to 100 million in the next possibly maybe one or two months there have been 1.7 million dead but if you look across the reported cases you find very strange things the us has got the largest number per million people <laughs> even now it's going up by more than 100 150000 numbers death rates are very very high india despite having a population of 1.38 billion people is only 10 million and is coming down almost every day yesterday was only 20000 with maybe 350 uh, people dead in terms of death rate per million in terms of infection india has done well brazil has done reasonably well even though the small country of 220 million people we are seeing it come up in um, europe and everybody is spinning hopes on the vaccine and the vaccine has been rolled out i saw yesterday that prince salman in the in the saudi in the, in the royal kingdom of saudi arabia also took the vaccine leaders take the vaccine citizens will follow because they want leaders to lead and i think this is a very very good sign that the world leaders trust the vaccine and the vaccine could be a panacea possibly help people uh, come back to economic life next india's health impact well you can see the data here the death rate is quite low at maybe 120 right now per million population and the infection rate is also light low compared to uh, what the us and other countries are is affected different countries differently china we don't have proper data where the chinese released data for some time and then they have not released data we don't know but but the virus did come from china and all around the world by possibly february march you could see a downslide in the virus virus impact because of the vaccine and many other matters next what is the economic impact the economic impact has been devastating the world GDP may come down by 4.4%. This old data, it could be maybe 5 to 7%. Pre-COVID, the projection was 2%. So there's a swing of maybe 6.5 to 10%. And if you look at the United States, they'll have negative growth. Europe will have large negative growth. These are old numbers. The negative growth for, the, for Europe for the full year could be much higher because they're shutting down now. And India, the post-COVID projection was 10.3%, but I think it will be close to maybe five to seven percent because india is doing well we come out of covid uh, japan is minus china is still plus because china had minus in the first quarter so all around the world and how did the global economies respond the central banks of the world reduce interest rates to flood the market with liquidity usa the long-term interest rate the, the overnight interest rate has come to 0.25 percent japan is negative india has come down eurozone no interest canada is down everybody is down they flooded the market with the stimulus so that they believe that liquidity and financial support will uh, help people so i think it's extremely important for everybody to understand that the liquidity surge that has come as a response to covid will remain for some more time and this will possibly increase investment create asset bubbles we don't know but the world is in a very delicate situation as far as investments and response to the government is concerned next This time is different, every time is different, but this time is really different, more intense and sudden. We have never seen lockdowns on a large part of the world. We saw lockdowns, sudden drop in business. So tourism, uh, international travel, local travel by air, hotels, hospitality, cafes, everything that used to go through as part of normal life has come down. It's more pervasive. It started across many countries. And before COVID came, the world economy was very fragile. Uh, we are seeing the us china trade war uh, we are seeing much tension in the south china sea and uh, this has been a very fragile time and global growth has come down global trade has come down globalization was in retreat and at that point of time we had uh, covid come in so when the world recovers we have to see which countries do well and which countries do not do well but what is clear is covid 19 is an inflection point in the rise of a new world and i'll talk about that later and today the global economies are more integrated exports of percent of global gdp went from 19 percent to 20 to 30 percent international travel went from 682 million to 1.48 billion people so the world is more interconnected nobody can shut up the countries for too long they will be impacted yes many of them are shutting up the countries it is good for the short term to keep the virus at bay but sooner or later what happens elsewhere will impact all of us next 
The COVID has uh, exposed the war reliance on China. China makes 24% of the world's manufacturing. Largest exporter, largest importer, largest foreign currency reserves, largest investor around the world. And suddenly the US found that 92% of some medicine comes from China. Japan found a large part of its manufacturing comes from China. All the world found how dependent they are on China. And while the US-China trade war is going on, President Trump was trying to get back manufacturing to China. This over-reliance on China, which has been exposed uh, during the lockdown in China in February, March, has made the world think that they must diversify their supply chains. They must not depend so much on China. And that means China, which has been leading the world in growth for the last many years, uh, will have to now relook at growing its own internal economy. And China is a challenge for the whole world in terms of security, in terms of its policies, and in terms of what it's trying to do. And the world is very concerned. It had an impact on investments. Germany has passed a law to say that certain companies cannot be taken over unless government approves. Japan has done the same. India has done the same, locking out Chinese investment in this country. Uh, because after what happened in Wuhan with the virus, the world has reduced trust on China. And now we'll see possible next 10, 12 years, supply chain more diversified, everything not coming from China, and we'll see a very different kind of world. Next. Well, the world stimulus so far, $12 trillion. This does not exclude the one, nearly $1 trillion that President Trump is supposed to have signed yesterday or will sign today. That means by the time it ends, you could end up with maybe $15, uh, 15 trillion. And if it is $15 trillion, then I think we are going to have a, so much of money floating around. Uh, before the stimulus, the world had $36 trillion of government bonds from the OECD, out of which $18 trillion was negative. Now it may have gone up to maybe uh, $50 trillion. And I think it's very important that uh, we uh, understand what the impact of all this will be. The surplus capital interest rates are very, very low. Interest rates are very, very low. And I think it's very, very uh, important that uh, uh, important that uh, we understand this impact and we also put in place the many, many things that are required to manage this. So we are in for a very different world compared to the world that was there earlier. This has an impact on pension funds. Europe has got an aging population, average age of 47 years. Japan interest rates are less. So what happened to people whose pension funds have to be invested? Where pension is phased from investments made earlier. When yields are very low, there are challenges. About 30 to 40% of all companies in the US and Europe are supposed to be zombie firms, firms which can only really pay low interest and never repay back the principals. But the banking sector in future is going to be very, very sensitive to interest rates. Next, please. So India's relief measures, India did have a stimulus of $265 billion, out of which uh, maybe about 40, 50, trillion, 40, 50 billion dollars was actually cash payouts and the rest were liquidity measures and ga loan guarantee for the SME. So the government of India gave free rations to 800 million people, free gas towels to 80 million women, uh, money to 95 million farmers, etc. But the bottom of the pyramid was reasonably taken care of. Of course, India has suffered pain and they also gave about uh, 40 billion dollars of uh, loan guarantees for MSMEs. Uh, maybe about $20 billion of uh, loans to farmers, etc. So government also responded like every other country, and it has been around nearly 10% of GDP, and the government is expected to do more. Next. Crude oil. All of you are in the biggest oil producer in the world, and I'm sure you'll all be looking at it in concern. Uh, before COVID, the world was consuming maybe around 100 million barrels of oil a day. After COVID, suddenly in February, March, it fell down to $70 billion. Of course, uh, the Royal Kingdom of Saudi Arabia tried to make sure the prices stabilized. It spoke to Russia. Russia did not agree. So Saudi Arabian government increased oil prices. They came down to $15 a barrel. We saw this. Some derivatives were negative. Everybody was surprised. And then, of course, they came out with a production cut, uh, which has worked to stabilize price. And now they're increasing the production somewhat. But oil, which was before COVID, maybe a $4 trillion industry has now come down to a $2.5, $3 trillion industry. Oil is a very important part of the global economy. But uh, today, uh, because of COVID, people are seeing the blue sky. People are seeing 
uh, clear waters in the lakes and rivers in many parts of the world because of lesser human activity. There's a drive for a uh, drive for electric vehicles, etc. So now uh, the oil exporting countries will have to look at the global economy and reconfigure the economy. And we are all very happy outside that the the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is looking at diversifying the economy under a young prince, and hopefully they will lead the way. Uh, to make the Middle East a very, very vibrant part of what the world will be. The investment made by the Middle East in digital technologies on the world are going to have a very, very big impact. So this has impacted the oil industry, and we need to see how it will impact it going forward. Next. And this slide shows you the impact of COVID. Digital technologies and the digital world has taken off. And then the physical world in terms of airlines, they're all down. International travel has almost come to a standstill. There are 12 of the major global airlines are in trouble. They may go in for bankruptcy or whatever. But there is a deep challenge all around the world and our habits have changed. Research says that for 45 days, if you change your habit, your habits change forever. Today, most of us uh, get up in the morning, we, we, we look at news on our mobile, we watch TV on our mobile maybe, then we buy goods on e-commerce, we do banking on the mobile, we have entertainment on the mobile, children get education on the mobile, we get health services from the doctor on the mobile, and uh, we also do our business on the mobile. So all companies have to reconfigure their business. In India, 85% or 90% of the total four and a half million IT employees went to work from home within 15 days. They're extraordinary. Today, financial institutions, banks, government, everybody went from work from home. And when you come back to normal, maybe 25, 30, 35 percent of people will still work from home by rotation because the world has learned that you don't have to travel so much. You don't have to commute so much. You can get work done. Of course, we need human interaction. There's a need. But the way we work, the way we live, the way we communicate, the way we do business is going to change forever. And we are seeing the arrival of the digital revolution. 200 years ago, the industrial revolution came and changed the world and bought power to uh, Western Europe, to Europe and the United States later. But today with the digital revolution, Asia will dominate the world in the next 10, 12 years, led by China, India, and hopefully the Middle East. So all countries have to reconfigure and look at the digital economy and take advantage of this. And this slide shows you starkly the impact in one single glance. Next. The new normal is global tech, the rise of the global digital monopolies. Apple has got its own system of iOS. Apple does much of the work that you want to do. Alphabet, Google has got the largest quantum of data in the world, Amazon, and all of them are 1.5, $1.8 trillion companies. Apple went to $2 trillion. So we've seen the rise of these global monopolies, and they're not restricted by geography. They're all over the world, barring maybe China, which has shut them out by the Great Firewall, but they're getting into all kinds of industries. Because in the digital world, which is now suddenly come upon us, it was coming, but it's come upon us much more, all of us have become a piece of data. Looking at the data that we all have, we are seeing that, uh, you know, we have to be extremely careful about how we do things. Next. And this is another, uh, another uh, you know, slide which shows you how the markets have seen the future. Uh, the Fangman companies, are given extraordinary returns, and the other companies in the market which have come back have not given so much of returns. So if you look at the top, uh, you know, most valuable companies, most of them are digital companies led by Apple, Microsoft, Google, Tencent, etc., Facebook, etc. And I think these are the digital giants that are going to dominate this decade unless you have some disruption which takes away their monopoly. Next. Indian tech has done extraordinarily well. Uh, before COVID, there had already been growth in e-commerce, in e-education, et cetera. But after COVID, again, they've taken off. Most of the companies noted here have seen the revenues grow by two to three X. Uh, India has now 41 unicorns, 148 sunicorns. And these sunicorns could become unicorns in the next, uh, next maybe four years. India is the third highest, third largest startup ecosystem in the world. And many of these companies have benefited tremendously. And we have seen 10 unicorns come up in, the, in this calendar year, 2020. So India too, the tech industry, especially startups, have seen a big, big boom. Next.
Now we are finding that agile tech companies will find more opportunities to innovate. Uh, you are seeing here that uh, how companies are growing their revenues, uh, whether they come back to pre-COVID levels or their post-COVID levels. Many of the digital companies are ahead of the COVID levels and many of the industries, their physical industries are still behind COVID. And this captures the dynamic structural change that has taken place. And this structural change will cause new competition, hopefully reduce cost to us, cost consolidation in future. And this is going to have an impact all around the world. Next. New normal investment. What are the impact on investment? There'll be a good flow of flow of good quality secondaries, consolidation financial services, growth in manufacturing using AI, machine learning, IoT, and 3D printing, etc. New age businesses, clear path to profitability, brand and alternate models, structural deals, sectors with good restriction. So, in an extraordinary number of new age industries, you're going to have rapid change, and new players are going to come. And this means capital will flow toward these new companies, give them disproportionate value, and they will have a competitive advantage to take over older companies. Could you believe that Tesla has more value than all the auto companies which have been around for 100 years taken together? And Tesla just makes about 300,000 cars a quarter. It's a very, very small part of the global economy, global auto industry, which makes 90 million four-wheelers a year as a revenue of $2 trillion. Next. Now, all around the world too, cash is becoming less in use. This is data about India. And uh, you are seeing that India's transition to a non-cash ecosystem to accelerate post-COVID. For the first time, uh, mobile payments exceeded ATM payments in India. I'm giving India as an example, because India reflects out of the 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, maybe uh, six, and a half billion, six and a half billion people, because all of us have similar economic conditions. Some could be richer, some could be poorer, but we are not in the OECD. And you can see how cash, which has dominated in many countries, is coming down. Digital payments have taken off in a very, very big way. Next, please. Digital content. In India, in uh, September, Jio had 14.7 GB of data being used by every subscriber, and Airtel has 17 GB of data. And you can see viewership on Hotstar and Netflix have shot up. And you can see that all across, uh, the use of music, everything else has shot up. Digital consumption has shot up to the roof. And this shows that there's a disruption in the world led by the digital revolution and led by telecommunications and led by enhanced digital, digital consumption. In India, you can almost get unlimited data for one and a half dollars a month. So any country which has got high quality wireless at very low rates is going to see an explosion of digital businesses. Next. Here are some examples from India about education. Next. Baidu is a great example. Baidu, the world's largest tech company, the valuation of 12 billion. You'll all be happy to know that Arin Capital, where I'm one of the founders and the chairman, gave $9 million to Baidu at 20 million pre eight years ago. And today they're worth $12 billion. They're done extraordinarily well. They have 95 million subscribers. They're in the Middle East too. They got five and a half million paying subscribers. And the digital explosion post COVID has allowed them to dominate the entire world. And this is a classic example of how some companies have taken advantage. Next. And they've changed people's habit. Children get up in the morning, they go to the next room, put on the uniform, go to the next room, open their laptop, sit down, attend to the classes, shut it down at four o'clock, and then go change and go play inside the house. Can you imagine that? They don't go to school, they're quite okay. Yes, it's a change in habit. It's not very good for children. It's not very good for students because we have to socialize. We are human beings. We need to meet people. We need to learn to live with each other. We can't become widgets. We can't become an AI algorithm. So are we in danger of becoming an AI algorithm? Maybe. In countries like Japan and Tokyo, Japan and Korea, there are people who become addicted, who become reclusive, who are sitting in their room the whole day and playing on their, uh, you know, on their mobile. This is not good for us. So we have to make sure as a society and as a people, we moderate digital consumption uh, just for the right levels so that we get used to it. Next. In health tech, we have seen enormous amount of digital innovation. India is creating a national health uh, stack where they'll have 
all the data, the plumbing layer connected to payments and your bank account, where all your data will be captured, will be available to you. You can go to your doctor and show them the data. Doctor can download, you can put all these diagnoses there and you can make payments. And this health stack will be there like the India stack. India has got something like the India stack, a piece of technology. I'm giving the example just to show people how technology is changing the lives. Next. And look at this company called Dozy. It's an extraordinary company. Dozy has used IoT to create a blanket which has got a lot of IoT devices. They put it under the bed, and then for every person in the ICU or in the bed, they monitor your cardiac, respiratory, sleep data, they monitor your vital signals, and they send it by mobile to a doctor who could be a little bit away so that uh, people don't need to be in the ICU. Why do you go to the ICU? Because the ICU has got all the equipment to monitor all your vitals on a minute by minute basis so that you can get the best care because of the critical condition. Now the COVID has shown that uh, ICU beds are in short supply and this kind of technology is helping save people's lives. And because the data that Dozy could get, they say in 25 to 30% of the cases where people are using this data, they can predict heart attack, they can predict what is going to happen. Because if you look at data of people uh, who have uh, had certain conditions and three, four, later, uh, three, four uh, days later, they have suffered something, you can get the data to predict and find out uh, what could happen if you are in the same condition, the same amount of, uh, kind of, same amount of data. So I think startups like this are revolutionizing healthcare and hopefully will make people get cheaper and better access to health. Next. Agriculture has seen a dramatic shift in the uh, use of agri-tech uh, because in India too, we found that much of the labor went back to the houses and farms were bereft of labor. So farms have automated all across India and tomorrow, uh, tomorrow when in the farm sector globally, automation is going to be the key. So the inflection point is going to change. One of the most traditional industries, the traditional sectors the world has ever seen and there's going to be an improvement in productivity. There's going to be improvement in quality and improvement in farmers' income for a period of time. Hopefully, overproduction will not make it less remunerative for farmers. But a lot of young companies have come up in agri-tech, which are changing the way agriculture is done. Next. Here's the company which has used sensors in the ground to find out the soil condition, plant the seed, water them based upon weather conditions, looking at the moisture in the air, and looking at the temperature, uh, doing just-in-time drip irrigation automatically runs uh, drones over the field to find out the condition. And then after that, they cut the crop and they deliver to consumers within 24 hours and pay the farmer immediately the next day. The entire supply chain has got automated. I'm just giving the example to show the remarkable ability of technology to improve the condition of life for every single citizen on this planet. And this is the way of the future. Because the earlier model, the industrial revolution model, depend upon the supply chain. Those people who control the supply chain control everything because between the producer and the consumer, you needed a supply chain. Now, all consumers are on a single platform, the internet. They're all connected together. So, be going on the internet, you're connected to millions of suppliers all around the world. You're connected to millions of people who can provide services. There is no more mystery about how to get things done. You get thousands and thousands of products available to you. They're all competing for you. And at the click of a button, you can get things wherever you want at a lower cost than otherwise. I think this remarkable change, I think is going to change the way the world is done. World is going to, uh, world is going to run in future. Next. You are in the grocery, you're seeing the kind of growth that's happening. Uh, GME has gone up 45% in May 2020. Now I think it's stabilized at about 60% over January of 2020. And many companies have come up. I'm sure even the Middle East, the same situation is there because people have stayed home, they take deliveries, and they don't go to supermarkets. They don't go to the malls. Yes, they will start going to the malls for entertainment, for shopping, etc. But the intensity will be quite low because price discovery is available all across the world. When you are in a country like Saudi Arabia, you can buy products in many parts of the world. It's a free market. So you look at prices, you look at commodities, and you'll buy, and you can go to places to observe what the goods are. So even in grocery, it depends upon fresh produce, there's been a change. Next. And this is something which is changing banking and financial services, the India stack. India stack has got four layers, consent, cashless, paperless, etc. 
uh, in the paper list, you've got Aadhaar, 1.2 billion Indians have a number. And using the number in the mobile, you can transfer money from one mobile to uh, one mobile, which is linked to a bank account to another mobile linked to a bank account in 30 seconds. 125 banks are connected to the system and they do it at almost no cost. And you can send the money transfer and last month, 2.1 billion transactions took place in one month. Look at the change. How will it impact banks? Banks have large branches. The branches will shift. Banks have large workforces in a the place. They can work from home. And branch don't, banks don't have to spend so much of money for physical infrastructure. Their IT can be on the cloud. They can use low-cost architecture and low-cost technology to reduce the cost and possibly make more profits or lend more money. Then you've got eKYC, which is automated and electronic, e-sign, digital locker, etc., and open data personal store and uh, how to make payments. So this is a classic example of a public use software. This is not owned by anybody. It's owned by a company. That company will be worth hundreds of billions of dollars. This is owned by a public authority. And the software was created by volunteers in Bangalore for the last 10 years. And this is an extraordinary piece of development that will be the panacea for the emerging markets all around the world to reduce the cost and deepen financial inclusion. Next. And you must see the sudden rates of change here. Uh, the, the, to get 50 million customers, the airline industry took 68 years. Cell phone took 12 years. And Pokemon took 19 days. Arogya Setu, which is uh, a, a health app, uh, took uh, only 13 days to reach uh, 50 million downloads. And there's a world record. Now they've got 160 million downloads. And everybody is monitoring the health and looking at who has got COVID on this app. Now, look at the pace of technology assimilation all around the world. Because everybody, almost four and a half, five billion people have got a mobile phone, four and a half billion people on the internet. Next. <coughs> Tech enable governance. Government's interaction with people also is uh, expanding. And I think Prime Minister Modi had a vision of digital India five years ago, and now it's working. 400 million people have got bank accounts. Uh, 80, 90 million farmers get money in the account directly. Yesterday, I think two days back, he released another installment of money. 85 million people, a woman get free gas connections. About 23 million building workers got money, etc. Now, in our interaction with government, we don't have to go to government offices. They will transfer money due to us by directly by DBT, direct benefit transfer. Our documentation, everything will be there. Approach will be there. So this shows a change in government. It means the power of government officials to control the activity will come down. There will be greater transparency, greater service for citizens. And this is a change that's happening all around the world. Even in Japan, the new Prime Minister Suga-san has said that he is going to revolutionize many of the Japanese practices and create a digital government. For example, the Japanese used to have their own personal seals. That will be done away with. And many reforms are coming all around the world. Next. So India's long-term growth story is intact. And to my mind, this COVID means a shift of economic power from the West to Asia. Asia has 60% of the world's population. Asia has maybe 35% of the world's GDP. And Asia will dominate in future. Asia includes the Middle East, India. It includes Southeast Asia. It includes China, it includes Japan. What is required in the common market without China dominating? Now we have the RCEP where many countries have come together, but China is a big beast in the room. We need to be careful because they can dump all their capacity into other countries and destroy local industry. But whatever it is with Brexit, the UK will open up to the entire world. The US will now diversify supply chain away from China. New security uh, arrangements will come with the uh, United States, Europe, Australia, Japan, and India coming together. And I think um, economically, India is in good shape. It has the lowest external debt to GDP of only 20%. It has a low trade deficit, strong tailwinds in, in the form of demographic dividend. This year has been a tough year. Next year is going to be a high growth year. And India and the Asia will lead the world in the next 20 years. Next. Thank you very much. And I want to end by saying we must look at this event as an inflection point. An event where the digital world has come upon us. The digital revolution is in full sway. And the world has changed dramatically. People's habits have changed. New business models have come. New ways of working is going to come. Everybody is interconnected. And there is going to be a deeper participation by people all over. Better services, 
access to education, access to health, access to finances is going to accelerate. And economic power will shift from the West, which is an aging society, to the East, which is very, very vibrant. New political equations will come up in this decade. So this decade, which you're going to see in the next three, four days, 1st January 2020 till 31st December 2030, is going to be the most dramatic change in the world. Ever since the First World War and Second World War, changed the way the world ran for very many centuries. And this decade will remember as the decade of the digital revolution. And all of us professionals, business people, citizens should see how to take full advantage of that and do well for others. Thank you for inviting me and thank you very much for listening to me. I am speechless, Mr. Mohan. I don't know how you remember so many data. It's coming like you know, a supercomputer in your mind. I just only one question from my side. Yeah. We are talking about so much technology is going to help humankind and all society. And probably they will predict what I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. My only one question, I just wonder whether we have any model which can say how is going to be 2021. Well, I think uh, 2021, all economies are predicting the economy will come back because Europe will recover. This is going to be the worst month possibly. Uh, US is recovering next year. It won't be negative. Uh, China is recovering. Japan has pumped in money. So all part of the world will recover. The growth will be very high because the last year's 2020 growth was very low. So economic upwards will expand. But the world will be a different place. Even though the world GDP may go up by maybe five to six percent. Five to six percent on 80 trillion dollars is about four to five trillion dollars, right? And that is going to be very high. Everything will go up. But what will not go up, what will go up is something that we have to see because the impact of digital technology is being filled. Since I'm talking to you people from Saudi Arabia, I have one request to all of you. I think the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia should build a digital partnership with India. We must remember China has its own digital empire with Ant Financial, Baidu, with the Alibaba, everything, and it is a is very, very advanced. The United States has got all the global monopolies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, they want to dominate the world. Europe has shut itself behind data protection laws. They don't have digital companies. So what should the rest of us do? That's why I would urge all the authorities in Saudi Arabia and all of you to look at Saudi Arabia, India, digital partnership. Where Saudi Arabia could leverage the digital assets India has and use it to train his own people in artificial intelligence, machine learning, in IoT, in 3D printing, which is the dream of the young Prince Salman. And I think by doing that and accessing the Indian talent, they can do extremely well. Let me give some data. The United States has 6 million software engineers. 1 million are Indians. In India, 4.5 million people work in software, out of which 2 million work for American companies. Out of 8 million working in American companies, 3 million are Indians. They're the most dominant workforce for America in the entire world. 25% of Silicon Valley founders are Indian. Of the top 10 software service companies by market value, 10 are Indian. Of the top five, three are Indian. TCS is the most valuable software service company overtaking IBM. Of the 10 of the, of the 20 million people, uh, I mean, the 2 million people working in the top 10 companies, 1.5 million are Indians. And every year, 250,000, 300 young people join the software industry in India. So India has an inexhaustible base of software engineers and technology and everything else. Uh, Saudi Arabia has an advanced economy which has to reconfigure. It has to change. It has to be a dominant part of the digital revolution in the future. And it's time for a Saudi-India uh, a digital partnership which will now redefine the way business does or does uh, business is done in the future and i think with uh, the saudi arabian investment the vision fund with masa which has now suddenly become extremely successful and the deep friendship that saudi arabia in the middle east has with india and prime minister modi this is a new era so we require a digital partnership between the middle east led by saudi arabia and india to redefine the digital world in future and work together to make each other more prosperous. Thank you, Mr. Mohan. It's excellent. I think we will take up more questions. Before that, you know, I just want to invite one of the legend person who is a businessman by birth. He carries very strong ties with uh, India. He has been 
head of uh, chamber of commerce as vice chair for multiple uh, innings and very special to SIBN because he has served SIBN as a founding member and continue today as a role of president for Jeta chapter. Let's welcome Mr. Majin Butterji to give a word and probably he can give the best answer how uh, we can leverage technology advantage what is available in market. Mr. Majin Butterji, over to you. Okay, thanks a lot, Andrea Lee. Uh, Thank Mr. Mohan, what we hear, uh, very advanced information. And uh, we hope, uh, as you mentioned, uh, 2021 20, will be better and uh, many things will be covered. And I am sure the partnership between uh, Saudi Arabia and India is great. And we are looking to be better because it is a long, long, long relation, thousand of years. So, still, uh, we are looking more, more and more. Uh, we have, uh, maybe most of us hear about the budget of the 2021, which the King uh, announced it, uh, 10 days ago, and the deficit has reduced, and this is built in price of petrol, I think, uh, less than $50. So I think if the price of dollar price of uh, petrol has increased, I am sure will be a big difference in the budget. And this is of course reflect in all economy. Uh, most of us we know how uh, maybe have hard time and uh, from beginning of the coronavirus uh, start, uh, the government take very strict. Uh, uh, rules as uh, no going, no coming, a lot of, uh, I mean, strict things. But I think it's reflect what we are uh, having now, less virus corona uh, between the most of the people who is living in Saudi Arabia. So I don't have much to tell or to mention after uh, Mr. Mohan's speech. And uh, as uh, you mentioned, maybe we need a lot of uh, uh, cooperation in uh, all this, uh, uh, I mean, digital, uh, digital things, digital finance, digital work, because uh, with this uh, coronavirus, uh, what happened, people start working, uh, distance working, learning distance, a long time ago, we don't have here uh, approved any of the learning distance certificate. Now it is insist and everything is uh, distant learning. Uh, many people uh, work uh, from distance. So we know now we have this meeting, everybody in his office, everybody in his country, and we have this uh, meeting and useful meeting. So completely this one year has change many many of the thing okay we are we believe maybe many of the people they will lose their job because uh, this distance meeting but i am sure there are many many people where they will have job many people who cannot travel they cannot uh, come visa problem all these things from this distance and uh, discover new things, how to meet, how to do work from distance. This is will increase a lot of work and uh, will decrease the cost. So maybe efficiency will be more uh, profit uh, or uh, the cost will be less. So we have more, 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 more business. Let us to take the negative to be positive. And uh, we hope both country, both uh, nation work hard, hard. So we'll be safer in uh, 2021. And I'm sure uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, all, all the whole Gulf country and India, this country still there are improvement in, uh, in economy. And uh, both uh, when they work together, I am sure we'll have better result. Again, thanks a lot and thanks for everybody joining this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Majid. Really appreciate your continuous support to SIBN 
and business community i am sure we can take the voice to leaders at right forum and we can help this community either side whether india or saudi or anywhere else who are connected basically if you add value to business society yes nobody is better than you to connect to saudi authorities thank you a lot uh, mr mohan uh, i just heard that you have committed us up to uh, for another two more minutes i know you have another meeting so probably we need a full day session with you to deep dive into every sector of the you know you have talked much and i hope that next speech when you come you can take us to a solution which probably i just say ai hey i hey siri like that some something you know what's going to be tomorrow market what's going to be a, a future of my business domain in demand or pattern i hope that that type of technology comes in very soon with that word i just say you can say uh, i just want to say uh, standing applause for you Thank, thank you very much thank you thank you very grateful to all of you good meeting all of you i'm very happy to be talking to all of you and wish you all the best for the for the for 2021 thank you very much thank you mr mohan thank you bye bye ladies and gentlemen let's welcome our next speaker let me try to share the screen is our own sibn member and sectoral head for finance committee friends he carries splendid knowledge on saudi arabian business and advisory let's welcome mr raghav yes one one point i just had a message from raghav uh, suddenly he has to move out so maybe he is having some net connected issue but definitely it will work well without it video so raghav be free to on off your video and let's uh, share your screen for presentation raghav over to you uh thank you so much vijay and hope i am audible to everyone yes okay so uh can you can you move to the next screen please you i think you had see? yeah okay and i was uh, you know listening uh, in the in the in the meanwhile to uh, dr pai and uh, you know on the back of uh, indian growth story uh, our sensex has also hit 47k for the first time today wow so, okay yeah so uh, so uh, very very good afternoon uh, everyone uh, for for attending this and uh, you know when when i was looking at the budget so so firstly i'm in the the entire session for the for sort of unraveling the nuts and bolts of the budget should last at least for an hour however i'm not here to scare you and uh, i've been allotted 10 minutes so i'll try to sort of skim past uh, you know certain uh, major aspects of the budget in the time that i have so when you look at the overall budget so you know if it comes across as a very balanced budget in the sense that it offers assurances from the government's ability to manage the crisis and gradually restore the pace of economic growth yeah and the stimulus packages which the government has offered uh, you know during 2020 has certainly taken a very heavy burden on its expenditure and even as public revenues declined amid uh, you know decreasing oil prices and as mr pai also mentioned that during april uh, 2020 there was uh, you know a negative forward on uh, on the oil prices and this sort of had uh, you know severe repercussions on the overall oil trade so uh, you know despite the overall uh, emergency response that dominated the better part of the year the government's uh, central agenda of economic diversification away from the oil sector has continued and the 2021 budget on an overall basis indicates a continued strong commitment Uh, to achieving fiscal uh, fiscal stability and sustainable long term economic growth yeah uh, amid continued uh, oil market volatility we view the government's uh, decision to maintain a similar level of public expenditure as last year despite the volatility in the oil market as a testament of its committing uh, towards achieving fiscal social and economic targets yeah indeed the focus of 2021 as was uh, the case in 2020 would be to sort of build the non oil economy which uh, you know remains and which will support the higher economic and social reform as well as employment generation so on on to uh, on to this particular slide uh, you know where i sort of captured the budget snapshot so as you can see the total revenues are forecasted uh, to be approximately 849 billion which is 10.2% higher than the total estimated of 2020 which is around 770 billion which i'll be covering in the next slide 
and uh, you know on the expenditure side we would be having uh, around 990 billion budget for 2021 with a continued focus on promoting economic growth and improving spending efficiency and the reason i say so spending efficiency is that the expenditure which i am targeting for 2021 is around 7% less than the estimated spending for this particular year which is 2020 as the kingdom sort of uh, you know seeks to tame a huge budget deficit which has uh, arisen because of petroleum revenues and covid crisis yeah and uh, in this uh, 2020 uh, the kingdom also expects to post a deficit of 298 billion this year which would be approximately 12 uh, approximately hovering around 12% of uh, our gdp as crude revenues are slated to drop and the next year our uh, fiscal deficit is around 141 billion as you can see from the slide which would be uh, you know 4.9% uh, Uh, you know of our gdp for next year and just some information nugget that we also plan to sort of balance the budget uh, you know by the end of 2023 so can you move to the next slide please abhijay can you move to the next slide please you are on uh, mute abhijay uh, you can move to the next slide yeah, yeah. thank you so uh, you know as as you can see uh, from this slide we expect uh, for the current year the tax revenue to sort of hover around 257 uh, billion and the non tax revenue to sort of increase from 592 now analysts will sort of certainly be aware that uh, you know we had introduced vat starting uh, you know in july uh, uh, yeah i mean in july 2020 and we also had custom duty so that would certainly uh, you know have a full year impact in 2020 and for this reason our tax revenue would have a significant jump as compared to uh, you know my non tax revenue similarly as i as i spoken about uh, the deficit as well so 298 billion is what, where we would be ending in this particular year and against 141 billion which is our estimate point to note here is also around the public debt so in the public debt requirement for tw- the same slide vijay yeah the public debt requirement for uh, you know next year would be approximately 83 billion which is expected to push my public debt to 937 billion by the end of 2021 which will be equivalent to 32.7% of the gdp compared against 854 billion as uh, you know estimated for 2020 which was approximately 34.3% of gdp however here worth noting is that the uh, the anticipated sharp rise in the public debt resulted in the government raising the public debt ceiling limit Uh, from 30% of gdp which was in place since 2017 to 50% of gdp uh, you know which was amended in march 2020 yeah can you go on to the next slide vijay right so uh, here we sort of take a, a deep dive on revenues so as you see from this figure uh, it demonstrates that the oil revenues will still remain the dominant source of government financing yeah though the government is encouraging economic diversification uh, by encouraging and incentivizing small and medium enterprises private sectors yeah and in fact economic diversification is also one of the pillars of vision 2020 2030 and tax and fee deference are likely to sort of provide a boost to revenues next year as the authorities are expected to unwind the covid related stimulus measures and the 2021 budget also sort of uh, highlights that the economic the shocks which were faced by the kingdom resulted in a reduction of revenue for 2020 to 770 billion which is 7.6% lower than what was envisaged in the original 2020 fiscal year budget or 16.9% lower than the 2019 outcome and the brunt you know of 2020 uh, revenue decline which i mentioned in my opening remark stemmed from the uh, stemmed primarily from the fall in international prices that saw the oil component of public revenue decline by almost 30.6% year on year yeah 
and uh, you know again some uh, some information nugget here that the average price for 2020 uh, where the uh, br- uh, the brent oil was trading at approximately 41.1 dollars uh, as against you uh, 64 dollars in 2019 however it is worth noting that according to international energy A- agency which is iea oil demand in 2020 was estimated at 91.3 billion uh, million barrels per day which is 8.8 million barrels per day lower in 29 than 2019 however the demand is anticipated to uh, increase to an average of 97.1 million bill, uh, barrels per day in 2021 which is sufficient to support the brent crude average prices to 46.7 dollars so coming to uh, dr mazin's point as well that even in 2020 the likely brent price is to trade below 50 dollars that is uh, the average is expected to hover around 46.7 dollars yeah and in terms of the uh, yeah so in terms of the expenditure the actual government spending uh, you know in the fiscal year 2020 is estimated uh, was estimated to approximately 1.47 trillion compared to the original spending of 101.0 uh, trillion so the authorities uh, you know in 2020 successfully contained total spending amid stimulus measures such as wage and income support for saudi nationals covid-19 suppression measures in the healthcare sectors sanad program and uh, you know i mean several uh, loan deferment and moratorium schemes which were offered to small and medium enterprises and other businesses by diverting funds from a variety of sectors and uh, as you can see uh, of all the three largest spending components by sectors education defense and healthcare and social development only education saw an increase in 2020 uh, you know rising by an estimated 1.4% uh, you know year on year health and social development meanwhile were contained despite covid by a diversion of funds within the companies yeah and a key pillar of spending support uh, you know expected by the government in 2021 uh, relates to its ongoing efforts under the privatization program which is a source of revenues as well as reform uh, objective so privatization program is the public private partnership which is also one of the pillars and which is also a part of the 13 vision realization programs which is vrp yeah as part of the vision, uh, bigger vision uh, 2030 uh, moving on to the next slide uh, vijay yeah so here what i've tried to capture is uh, you know the uh, the deficit as well as the public debt so the budget deficit in 2020 fiscal year has deteriorated sharply in both nominal terms as well as the percentage of gdp so the budget deficit increased from 133 billion in 2019 to an estimated 298 billion so in 2019 our budget deficit was just 4.5% of the gdp it has gone up to 12% uh it is estimated to go up to 12% by the end of 2020 yeah and uh, where against the next year we are sort of targeting uh, you know budget deficit to be contained to 141 billion returning it back to 4.9% of the gdp and a widening budget deficit and the nominal gdp contraction together raised the public debt stock substantially from 678 billion which was 22.8% of gdp in 2019 to an estimated 854 billion which is 354 uh, sorry 34.3% of gdp despite the still high budget deficit envisaged in 2021 to uh, 937 billion in nominal terms an expected recovery in the real and nominal gdp will result in the public debt to gdp falling to 32.7% so imf Uh, in this year has forecasted an average uh, you know shrink of approximately 4.4% of the global economy yeah and uh, our own uh, uh, saudi's estimate is to shrink by at least 3.7% at the end of 2020 where uh, whereas for the 2021 our forecast is to sort of uh, increase our growth by at least 3.2% so the increase in our nominal gdp will offset the increase in public debt in ensuring that my total gdp debt as a percentage of gdp comes down here it is also worth noting is if we can, you can stick uh, for a minute vijay on the previous slide uh, here it is also worth noting on the last figure which is figure 2 point uh, which is figure 3 that where do we stand against public debt of emerging economies and the wider world 
so uh, you know you'll you'll uh, you'll be pleased to know that we the country's public to debt ratio public debt to gdp ratio remains significantly below its peers a situation that will be maintained given these peers uh, you know have also witnessed sharp deterioration in the public sector balance sheets since the pandemic emerged yeah so uh, moving on uh, to the last slide so here uh, you know so what 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 are the key takeaways from this budget very quickly supporting the domestic economy so you know covid 19 related stimulus measures are likely to be eased further in 2021 as the domestic economy continues its recovery however the government will still maintain fiscal flexibility as an insurance against additional domestic and international economic shocks similar to you know what we are hearing now with the new strain found in uk south africa brazil and several other countries so it's it's very prudent on part of the saudi government to still maintain you know fiscal flexibility uh, the second aspect is maintaining fiscal sustainability so the budget statement uh, you know reaffirmed the government's commitment to fiscal sustainability and spending efficiency and how how do they demonstrate it is that by taming down my public expenditure yeah a trend that will be supported by efforts to contain costs for example via efficiency gains and a continued determination to increase non oil revenues encouraging private sector development i think it it has it has been a no brainer since the past uh, 18 to 24 months on the government's efforts and its strong impetus and thrust to sort of promote the growth and development of smes private sector and uh, you know uh, diversify the overall economy so that will still continue to be uh, the spending priorities remain unchanged so you know education healthcare social development uh, you know defense no voice uncertainty yeah. hello continue yeah it is also worth noting that uh, uncertainty is likely to remain an underlying theme over the next year due to inherent volatility in the kingdom's main trading partners and in international capital markets yeah moving to the right side where you see focus sectors so to uh, mr uh, pai's point about you know the digital transformation so education is one of the sectors where there is a lot of impetus and there is a lot of focus by the government in order to sort of uh, promote e learning distance education digital transformation information security teacher preparation programs education for people with special needs yeah early childhood and elementary grade so on and so forth similarly healthcare and social development the budget uh, for 2021 is set to increase by 4.6% as compared to the uh, amounts allotted for the year 2020 and here Uh, you know the government is trying to focus on the model of care the accountable care organizations in the decentralized healthcare clusters will continue to dominate the healthcare agenda moving on to infrastructure i mean there are a lot of projects uh, you know towards uh, aimed towards infrastructure and in the 2021 budget the government is seeking to renew its focus on vision 2030 projects even as it remains aware of the risks that further short term stimulus measures may be needed and for this reason it continues to sort of maintain the fiscal uh, you know flexibility additionally to aid rapid urbanization the transport sector is you know expected to witness improved transport links such as metro systems bus and besides the government continues to focus on major projects such as neom red sea project amala kidia are expected to have a huge impact on the country's economy in the long term so i guess this was a quick uh, you know snapshot of the overall budget i mean if if there are questions or if uh, you know there are interested uh, in, uh, entities and individuals uh, you know please feel free to reach out to me and we'll be more than happy to uh, you know speak in granular details of what this budget entails for your particular sector thank you so much uh, everyone for a very patient hearing and uh, thank you vijay uh, for the opportunity and thank you raghav actually again is you know data driven i don't know how many data you are remembering and you try to concise in few minutes talk uh, we really say thank you for your making it out as promised and friends as i i just pick up last word uh, red sea and neom and the money is going in and new technology is coming in is mind boggling 
people are even talking about making water from moisture so that type of uh, new developments we are going to see in reality in saudi arabia so that's a good message we have opened up this forum a basis that we can discuss more on some sectors we are having learned a speaker with us before i go to other speakers let me just uh, get back to our uh, guest speaker mr raspurot is there yes okay great uh, just let me see friends a short introduction about his excellency dr pradeep singh raspurohit he has been a uh, deputy uh, ambassador to saudi arabia earlier before moving to ministry of external affairs presently heading uh, sarc and bim stack division a very very uh, friendly and community friendly uh, ifs uh, officer i am sure you will love to hear him and of course he is doctor by profession today is need everybody want to have opinion from doctor before going to anybody else let's welcome mr yes. rasprai <clears throat> thank you um, mr vijay soni ji esteemed panelists and the participants of today's session it is uh, indeed my pleasure to be part of this discussion today i left saudi arabia in the month of august this year and i have i carry very fond memories presently working in india's neighborhood uh, division in our ministry of foreign affairs in new delhi i have served for a long uh, period of my career in the in the arab world uh, before uh, saudi arabia i served in uh, in uh, as a ambassador in iraq and in uae so uh, uh, i am really glad to see the sibn taking forward this kind of activities and uh, i thank his excellency dr asaf said the ambassador of india to the kingdom for setting up this uh, network and uh, having a, such a wonderful discussion we had a uh, very amazing uh, presentation by mr mondas pai and mr raghav and um, as far as the bilateral relations are concerned uh going by my time here in the world i say that uh, uh the relationship is on an upward trajectory with saudi arabia and uh, uh, both the countries are actually complementary to each other with saudi arabia's uh, investment and gas surplus and energy resources on india side the technology and uh, the manpower there is a great understanding between our relationship is going forward and that can be seen in the economy between the leaders when they actually meet there have been regular visits between the top leadership our prime minister was in october in 2019 he was there the crown prince visited earlier that year uh, in 2016 the prime minister also visited the last visit of pm was remarkable in the sense that there was a strategic partnership agreement was uh, signed between the two countries Uh, uh please note that saudi arabia has signed such agreement with india india is the third such country uh, so it's 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 remarkable and it sees india's key role in the vision 2030 of the uh, of the kingdom so uh, the strategic partnership council has two uh, verticals one is on the political security and people to people ties and the other is on economy and uh, uh, investments and that includes energy also so uh, when we, we we talk about the economic and the business relations i think at the top level there is a conscious decision to make a separate uh, pillar on in the strategic partnership in which our commerce and industry minister and saudi energy minister are the co chairs uh, when we talk about the economic and commercial relations i mean the bilateral trade was at 33.1 million 1 billion or so Saudi Arabia is the fourth largest trading partner of uh, India. Uh, it is a major source of energy with 18% of the crude oil and about one third of our natural gas we import from the kingdom. I believe Saudi Arabia is now the biggest supplier of uh, crude oil to India. Uh, there are about 500 companies uh, from India operating in in the kingdom with a total investment of 1.5 billion. Uh, on the other hand. Uh, the saudi investment in india has been limited there have been indirect investments in several companies 
uh, but then there is no direct uh, such a uh, I mean, significant investment. So that is one area where probably uh, we need to work more and and uh, attract the Saudi companies to to invest. Uh, uh, we have a large Indian community there for a long, long, long time, and then playing an important role in the in the building of the country. Uh, I say, uh, you know, uh, during my uh, limited uh, brief stay in the kingdom, that in India there is very limited uh, consciousness or awareness about the business climate, the business environment available in the kingdom. And because of that, what is happening that, I mean, there are enough companies, startups, and there are people uh, ready to move. But then they end up going to the smaller countries and the kingdom remains, you know, because there are certain perception issues. So uh, uh, for the uh, business network and for the entrepreneur to, to change this perception, there is an urgent need of this. But that will actually open the floodgate and they have to be actually taken around. And, uh, you know, the delegation level or, or workshops or um, in today's time, the webinars or whatever means we have. We need to change this perception that yes, Saudi Arabia is also a country where one can go for investment, one can open up joint venture. There are, you know, business friendly environment. Uh, uh, when it comes to in my limited time, I just want to touch upon key areas of uh, collaboration in the in the present period of COVID pandemic and all. First of all, the Saudi government has has extended uh, immense help and support to the Indian large Indian community in their repatriation. A huge re a repatriation exercise, uh, giving them access to the healthcare facilities and testing and everything. The the uh, uh, key areas where we probably can work now, uh, one of them is the healthcare sector and the pharmaceutical sector. Very few Indian pharmaceutical companies are present in the Saudi market, and, and probably there are regulatory issues and all. And we have discussed at different levels with the Saudi authorities also. I think the Indian pharmaceutical uh, uh, industry, which is now called the pharmacy of the world, uh, can play an important role in bringing coming up there and, and uh, setting up joint ventures and kind of benefits and uh, in, in whatever they, they, their contribution. Healthcare, we are known for the medical system and all, and in the post-COVID world, uh, whole world has seen how India has managed and excelled in, in managing this pandemic and all. So uh, I think uh, I mean our leading healthcare chains and uh, medical experts and health professionals and all can play a very important role in the bilateral collaboration in the, in the, once the uh, pandemic is over. The three other important areas where uh, I think already work is going on, one is uh, renewable energy, where we are now Saudi Arabia is also part of the International Solar Alliance. It's already an investment uh, there and we have an MOU signed uh, uh, between the, the two countries during PM's visit. I think uh, that is a promising area. Uh, the other important area is education. For good quality, uh, higher education in the kingdom, and they have been approaching, uh, reaching out to the IITs and some key uh, 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 Indian education institutions. So uh, this is a promising area in terms of even the school, schools also, some of the Indian entrepreneurs are in touch. Uh, the third other area is the civil aviation, where we have signed an MOU and the number of seats we found have increased, uh, I mean, uh, uh, significantly in the last PM's visit and even before. So civil aviation is another area because there is still a limited number of direct flights. What we need is, and not the connecting flights, where actually uh, there is a use potential. Uh, and and uh, probably the other area where when the pandemic is over is, is, is the tourism and entertainment. Uh, some of you will be knowing that the Saudi government has decided to set up a mini India in Riyadh city also. So, uh, I mean, that's how uh, the seriousness given to the culture, tourism and entertainment. Uh, similar way, I mean, there are other um, uh, I mean, companies, entrepreneurs can work together in, in taking forward uh, the cultural relationship between the two countries. ICT and the Internet of the Things is another promising area with artificial intelligence and as uh, the earlier speaker has mentioned about the digital partners. We are also working with, uh, with the Saudi agency on cyber security related issues 
and lastly but not least is the defense cooperation which is a new area and where uh, i think uh, there is already an uh, agreement signed with, with with the saudi general authority for military intelligence and our ministry of defense uh, the saudi side is looking for collaboration in in uh, defense procurements and all and we are looking for uh, uh, i mean greater cooperation in, in this field there is already a training and capacity building uh, programs are going on and there was recently a visit by our army chief also to, to saudi arabia so with that limited observation as i have moved away from saudi arabia and uh, with limited updates i i think that there is a great potential for collaboration in different different sectors and we look forward to see a, a, a very robust kind of partnership between the two countries and um, i once again thank uh, the saudi india business network all the esteemed panelists and our most importantly our colleagues in the consulate in in uh, consulate in jeddah Uh, for organizing this event and uh, giving me this opportunity especially to i thank mr keshwani to 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 i mean give me the floor and uh, to interact with this esteemed panel and to thank you so much thank you mr rasprohit it's a great pleasure that you accepted our invitation at very short notice it happened to you. i just send one small message and he immediately confirmed yes i am available thank you <laughs> friends it's a great pleasure that we are having two icons here mr pradeep is sitting in delhi and mr majan is sitting over this forum so both the authorities if we have any issue where we need a support both are very friendly and they are you know i will say before we come go to them they say what help you need from us thank you very much now friends let's open the forum for our galaxy of speakers who wish to share their wisdom in particular domains let me just introduce panel which was uh, already circulated uh, our invitation the panel comprises of mr batterji mr rasprohit i don't know how long you are going to remain but whatever time is available yes it is our pleasure uh, yes ms samna mariam khan is already there myself i am keep troubling you bear with me Mr Raghav I think he has just gone Mr Vijay Mehta he is chair of international affairs committee of MENA region PhD CCI and he is a seasoned financial expert who has lived in various domain of India whether it is SEBI stock exchange or fund raising mergers is if you go to this profile quite long profile he carries similarly we are having with us mr martin sweder senior director he has been always positive with sibn last time he has said his knowledge about new regulation e invoicing mean to create a new norm in business transaction honor all hideout business i think will go out to maximum extent and i see a lot of collaboration opportunity from india because india has a one of the digit and complex taxation system that knowledge definitely can help this country to have a smooth ride with new regulations we have mr rajiv sukla he is heading hsbc saudi arabia and always remain available with us to share knowledge on banking and financial affairs rahul gosu honor legend in legal aspect he has been with saudi arabia right now is serving ua and always available to support us on any legal matters we may come through yes of course anindya my friend he is working with pwc india and he also want to throw like uh, what are the options available based on this budgetary announcement and global economy we already set the forum and we have listened a lot on that uh, before we go to uh, each one of you what we did you know each one is having sector expert so based on queries what we received from registrant we have come up some of the questions so we are going to take up those let's welcome mr martin to say you know people are worried you know a lot of regulations are coming mr martin you are there yes i am hello okay great great uh, we we are hearing that a lot of regulations are coming as it is becoming shrinking oil price is going down government also has to look for another source of revenue of obvious it has to be done now all of sudden we have seen a few months back vat increased to 
custom duties are continuously being increased recently one of the food product also 5% to 15% vegetable also covered that area which is, although the challenge is you know saudi arabia our neighboring country has not increased so there are certain issues and we also hear income tax so martin what's your view point going forward how do you think this taxation are going to come in force and going to become part of our life and how it will impact businesses as well as consumer mr martin over to you yeah thank you thank you um yeah i, I can say a few uh, words about that um mr ragav of, of course already talked through a lot of the uh, uh, numbers so i won't uh, be doing that uh, although i will mention a few numbers um, but I think what we've seen for the year 20 is that uh, overall taxes, uh, uh, the tax income for the, for the kingdom went down. Um, so there is a uh, overall approximately 10% reduction of tax income for the kingdom. Um, on the other hand, we've seen, of course, uh, as you mentioned, the VT rate increase that kicked in in July which obviously um, has not resulted yet um, in its full uh, uh, growth in tax revenue, but it is expected to create additional tax revenue next year. Um, and actually, uh, the expectation is that the indirect tax income, so VAT income for uh, the Saudi government, will uh, increase with about uh, 47%. So that's quite a lot. Um, on the other hand, we see that taxes overall um, either stable, uh, the income from, from taxes either stable or uh, slightly reducing. Um, so as a, as a sort of a conclusion on that, you can see that um, there's a shift from, from direct taxes to indirect taxes. So VAT and custom uh, duty income will be uh, the, the most important sources of income uh, for the kingdom. Um, obviously uh, utilized on, on, on spending on, on the mega projects, uh, the transition to uh, privatization um, and trying to uh, sort of uh, get away from the oil uh, income or at least be less dependent on oil income. Um, it is mentioned by a number of speakers already, technology also within text technology is taking um, uh, uh, pace. Uh, so you mentioned e-invoicing, the clear uh, indication that technology will take a prominent uh, uh, place in, in taxation um, and I think as you rightly mentioned uh, the kingdom can learn a lot from India we're actually uh, when supporting clients also looking at India and how uh, things have been dealt uh, with uh, e-invoicing in India so um, it's a great source of, uh, of knowledge um, income tax yes there is a lot of um, rumors about personal income tax so um, it's not defined in the budget, but you may expect some developments in that area coming year. Um, <clears throat> hopefully not, but yeah, uh, you never know. Um, the, uh, the kingdom is famous for uh, implementing uh, taxes uh, in a swift manner in, in many cases. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, another, another area where uh, probably uh, additional revenue will be there for the kingdom is uh, the real estate transfer tax that was introduced in October. Um, again, something that is quite new, but probably uh, comes to its full growth uh, in, in the course of next year. Um, I think the biggest question, uh, at least that was my biggest question overall, is uh, what the impact is of the increase in, uh, in VAT and custom duties on the ambition of uh, uh, the kingdom to be a trade hub in the world. Um, so hopefully we'll see also some changes in the rules uh, in relation to uh, basically fa facilitating uh, the movement of goods in and out of the kingdom, um, probably with the ambition to also create more jobs uh, and more work to be done uh, within Saudi Arabia. Um, so I think overall, uh, taxes will be an important factor for businesses coming in the coming year um, with a clear uh, emphasis on the indirect taxes being VAT and customs. Thank you, Martin. Uh, it's great pleasure to learn that what's uh, looking forward, probably we can also apply some AI which can predict, okay, uh, tomorrow this new regulation is going to come up so that I'm prepared well in advance at <laughs> least a uh, few hours. 
Yeah, well, it, it's of course something you may expect. I mean, if we are moving indeed towards e-invoicing, which will be uh, mandatory by the end of next year, so in December next year, uh, probably has its real effect then in uh, 2022. Um, but obviously, when you start reporting uh, all your transactions in a digital way to the government, uh, then it's only a small step for the government to use uh, data analytics, AI, to go through your data and to find, let's say, omissions uh, and, and extra uh, opportunities to collect tax from businesses. Um, so yes, technology will be an important thing. Um, and as a business, um, you basically have to be sure that you are prepared to deal with that change and the change in transparency and, and automation. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Uh, let me welcome uh, Mr. Vijay Mehta, uh, Chair of International <coughs> Committee, Meena from PhD CCI. He is alumni of Sriram College of Commerce. India is one of the top college and rank holder. Uh, he also runs capital market activities. Uh, Mr. Vijay, you know, uh, I, I know your background and I'm reading the Saudi budget, which is talking about financial sector development program. Uh, Saudi stock market, I will say still, if you compare it with India, yes, there are limited players. So obviously you can say there is uh, some room to have <coughs> more. Uh, to <coughs> I just would like to hear from you, uh, what's your take on this uh, exchange financial market where we can have a collaboration opportunity for business as well as professionals. And second question, what coming from audience is, what are the investment opportunity for people like us? As we are seeing stock markets are bumping, jumping, although economy has not grown. So you can give some clues over it. Over to Vijay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, everyone has been uh, aware of the growth which the Indian capital markets have witnessed, especially in the last seven years. And today, the main exchange, National Stock Exchange, is probably among the best and the biggest in the world in terms of the daily turnover and the number of transactions. It's a great day today in terms of capital market because today we have crossed uh, 40,000 on Sensex and it is 13,850 in terms of Nifty, which is a lifetime record. Uh, what I feel is that uh, Saudi Arabia, despite uh, being a very large uh, uh, um, powerhouse in the Middle East, has not yet been able to pay the attention required for development of its financial markets. In fact, uh, Middle East as a region has been lacking such kind of uh, 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 a number of intermediaries who are professionals in advising on financial sector mobilization and to provide capital to the companies who want to expand in different parts of the world. Today, in India, the capital market is acting as a catalyst. And a number of companies are, who are going public are able to get capital on their terms. And they are able to become world-class companies with the easy capital available to them. In return, the people who are investing into them, they are also multiplying their wealth in a matter of years. It's uh, doubling up. And we are seeing a qualitative change in their returns on the uh, amount invested. In terms of the question which you ask, I feel that it's very important for Saudi Arabia. It will be very beneficial to both the countries if beside the digital collaboration, we also go into a financial sector collaboration with each other. India can guide Saudi Arabia to become a very thriving and develop a very important capital market, which can act as a region, uh, the best capital market of the whole of Middle East. And the whole of Middle East can ensure that the capital which is needed by their industry can be raised by their own capital markets. And they can also over a time period, like you know, in the world markets, Today, 
China, Japan, Europe, America, and India. These are the five major markets whose index is watched very closely by the world. There is no one from Middle East, and Saudi Arabia can fill up that gap, and India can help Saudi Arabia to fill up that gap. Second, in terms of investment, which you asked, I feel that uh, 2021 is going to be another landmark year because though the economy has not been doing so well as was expected due to the obvious reasons of COVID, but I feel that uh, once the COVID is over, then Indian industry is growing to rise at a much faster rate. Like Mr. Pai said that in the beginning of COVID, the World Bank was estimating India to grow at a negative rate of more than 10.29%. But today, all the official estimates are in favor of saying that the COVID will affect only by a reduction of about 5.3%. And I think by the time we finish our financial year in March, these figures will further undergo towards a positive change. And people will be talking about a real rate of growth in the Indian markets. In the year 2021-22, I feel that a lot of steam has been, is still left in the Indian markets at present, though it is not the right time to buy. But of course, when the market heat cools down a little bit, which it will do because of the technical reasons, then at that time still, if one makes investment into good companies, which have potential to expand and bring good returns, I think there is still room for Indian investors, people in, investing in India to make good money. In fact, I would like to use the platform to invite Saudi capital to come into India and invest into promising company, uh, companies and they can be sure that they will earn returns which are far better than their investment which they are making in Europe or even in America. I will only conclude by saying that India needs capital and it has a lot of potential. In fact, it is going to be the most important expanding economies of the world in the next about five years. So this is the right time to come to India and this is the right time when Saudi and Indian partnership together can do wonders. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vijay Mehta. Uh, it's rightly right time you are making the note. If you see this financial sector program, what Saudi Arabia is talking in Vision 2030, is basically main objective is to develop robust financial market, which can support private sector as well as promote financial planning. The government is marking about 22 billion riyals fund for that uh, purpose. I think we have a lot of room for collaboration to support and we are having dignity in our forum. So we will take it forward. Let me just go to my next speaker for the day, uh, Mr. Rajiv Sukla, again, our colleague with SIBN. He is heading uh, as CEO of HSBC Saudi Arabia, uh, engineer by profession, uh, MBA from again, Institute of Management. He has worked with Tata Steel and investment bankers for 24 years. And I think he's here for Saudi Arabia for almost two decades. Uh, Mr. Uh, Rajiv, a question which came from uh, audience, which relates to is, how do you see banking and financial sector taking clues from today's discussion and budgetary announcement? I availability of liquidity, and financing priorities to industry and bank risk appetite. Because we see banks say, we have money we want to give, but when you go to bank, they say, no, 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 we are worried. So please, uh, Anish, or question. Thank you, Vijay. And at the outset, let me just thank you and SIBN for giving me the opportunity to address the question that you've asked. <clears throat> now, the banks reflect the underlying economy and banks play a key role as you kind of hinted in supporting economic growth. Hence, I'm very happy to speak about the banking and finance sectors. But first, let me just give a quick word on the budget from my viewpoint. I agree with Raghav 
the budget is pragmatic and consistent with the preliminary budget. That consistency helps the transparency with the signals for the future, provide investors and companies with comfort and guidance, which now goes just beyond one year. But uh, the utility actually has gone beyond just the budgeted numbers. For instance, um, you know, we, we know from announcements for the next couple of years, each year PIF will be stepping in with $150 billion annually. So the decline in the, uh, in the expenditure of 7% that Raghav mentioned actually reduces to just 2% if you factor in the PIF spending. Uh, along with that is the greater public the greater private participation that we see, uh, the various SAMA measures to ease the uh, issues, uh, and the various capital markets development, which I'll come into in just a bit. For us, the outlook for 2021 is positive. Uh, we are seeing early signs of that in the third quarter numbers and the early PMI indications. Of course, as uh, Dr. Pai said, the vaccine uh, should provide a return to normalcy in Saudi Arabia as well, uh, although obviously it will be back ended into the second half. Um, in the meantime, Saudi Arabia has not just done well in controlling COVID, but unlike other economies, we see the lock-in as not being too bad for Saudi economy because the money has remained inside the borders, circulated in the system, and ignited the very much needed domestic tourism entertainment boost uh, beyond just the Hajj and Umrah that used to be the main tourism drivers. Um, on the revenue side, as Martin mentioned, the big positive uh, is the full year effect of the tax revenue giving the government the needed diversification of revenue flows, which is a big pillar for Vision 2030. Now on the banking front, uh, we expect SAMA will likely keep the broad uh, monetary environment as quite loose. Uh, actually, it has worked well in 2020 uh, with the right signaling. I think uh, we found that this has reached the private sector with the bank claims on the private sector up from about 4% at the beginning of the year uh, up to 15%. In this <coughs> coming year, the steady drop in government's own funding requirements, which we see in the budget, uh, which will result in the lower left uh, deficit, also means there'll be less borrowing pressure coming directly from the government, um, leading to that stability in the debt to GDP, which was talked about at just uh, low 30%. Uh, we don't expect at all going into the next few years, the revised ceiling of 50% of the debt to GDP to be hit soon. The, the current state of the balance sheet of Saudi Arabia, which as a sovereign is highly rated at this low percent of debt to GDP remains, uh, makes it very highly um, attractive. We do not forecast any change in interest rates. The real, as everybody knows, is pegged to the dollar. Dollar interest rates are expected to remain low. Uh, indeed, in many of the advanced economies, we will be preparing for negative interest rates. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, we expect the policy rates to remain at a level of 50 basis points. The banking system, we expect, will remain liquid and well capitalized. It was very liquid during the past year. Uh, and the banks, as most people know, the Saudi banks uh, are among the best capitalized in the region and actually even beyond. Uh, this has been under the watchful and conservative policies of Sama. Uh, the banking merger, which we've seen a couple of them, Saab and Alawal, which should be completing soon, and uh, NCB and Samba, which should complete in 2021, uh, are, uh, you know, are again feeding into the pillars of the Saudi financial sector development program of having better capitalized banks, better able to support the various projects and compete with the uh, better compete with the regional and global banks. On the feeding into the risk appetite, the NPLs, uh, which uh, which had expectedly shown an increase in 2020, uh, seem to have stabilized. And, and actually, there's been quite conservative provisioning um, at very prudent levels. So although some of the defaults may continue in, uh, in 2021, release of provisions should allow absorption of any new defaults. However, we believe credit extension and risk appetite will remain somewhat cautious and very directed. Um, you know, in, in Mohan Das's uh, terms, it will remain quite delicate um, because the COVID uncertainties of what the new normal will be is, uh, is something which, which is not yet well known. And the general sense in the banks is that we have not yet seen the bottom of the credit cycle 
and there, therefore the lagging effects of the downgrades uh, of the challenges of COVID economy can still come to bite. So we think the risk appetite will continue to be cautious. However, the, because the banks remain liquid and well capitalized, they will continue to seek avenues for growth. So I think the beneficiaries will be the giga product, uh, projects and the government related entities uh, and those borrowers uh, of higher quality credits, even if the banks get at lower pricing, um, less attractive than the mid cap or SME lending. But you know we know the government and SAMA are determined to drive through and some of the deposit and deferral programs um, and the support programs uh, continue to provide the thrust to maintain some lending in lifetime to these sectors. Uh, I talked about the giga products and government related entities. The PIF $150 billion we think will be directed principally in the local economy um, for next year to these giga projects. Construction sector will remain somewhat challenging for banks. I, we know it is a large sector and it cannot be ignored, but I think here again, it will be selective and, and uh, credit will be directed to the better and more established underlying credits. And of course, the giga projects such as Red Sea, Kedia, as they come to market. But the real growth in banking will actually come from the retail lending, driven especially by the mortgage sector. Um, this we know is again, one of the other pillars of uh, Vision 2030, uh, getting housing for all the citizens and the programs which REDF and more mortgages purchases by the um, Saudi refinancing company, they which continue to drive hard um, and uh, having hurdled the initial blip of the 15% VAT, which was then replaced thankfully by the 5% transaction tax uh, has driven a huge growth in mortgages, which will, uh, which will continue into 2021. Uh, obviously there's a trickle down in, uh, effect into a variety of sectors. Uh, the other, although tourism and international travel is down, but uh, given the effect in the economy of local spend, uh, I think uh, restaurants, low entertainment, we are already seeing increases, uh, you know, coming out of the POS and ATM numbers. Uh, and of course, international tourism should open up once the vaccine programs take effect. Um, the corporate lending should also be supported by the broader privatization effort. Um, you know, privatization uh, of many forms we have seen one is just simply list the company like Aramco, there are others in the pipeline, but also asset and business sales. In 2020 itself, we saw uh, Sago, the Saudi grain mills private, privatized two of its four grain mills. Another two are in the pipeline. Uh, there's privatization of the PPP kind. Uh, the, in the education space, the Clear Building Corporation with the first wave of 60 schools, uh, that was affected and is in the pipeline. Other education and healthcare PPPs are on the way. and uh, being shepherded very well by the National Center for Privatization, which is firmly well established. The local bank lending actually should continue to be augmented by international bank financing. We do see plenty of involvement and interest in the coming year, uh, along with export credits, agency credits, especially project directed, whether or not linked to the local content of the home country of those agencies, as well as uh, by the larger companies and the sovereign international uh, Sukuk and bond issuances. Um, just switching from the bank to the capital markets, because that is, of course, uh, it is becoming a strong complement to the local bank financing. Um, it is here, I, I, while I agree with uh, Vijay Mehta on the collaboration, I disagree with him quite a lot on the developed uh, state of development of the Saudi market. And perhaps it's just a perceptional thing or people haven't been following closely, but essentially in the last uh, 18 to 24 months, Saudi Arabia's capital markets have actually catapulted and developed very, very rapidly, driven, of course, by the Aramco listing. Uh, Saudi Arabia now ranks among the top 10 capitalized markets of the world, but it was not just one company that, uh, that drove it. There was the inclusion of on the emerging markets indices, MSCI and FTSE, uh, acknowledged to be one of the fastest in the world. Um, then you've got the smaller board, the Nomu market, which is very active, sees direct listing um, into Nomu, and then you have a pathway uh, under certain parameters to, of those companies getting into the, uh, into the main market. Uh, none of this can be ignored. We see all the various elements uh, in terms of infrastructure being put in, 
We saw derivatives getting introduced for the first time this year with the, um, with the index derivatives coming into single stock perhaps next year and a proper depository system and central counterparty already there. We are already seeing alignment of the Saudi capital markets with the Western uh, capital markets. So we do see a lot of activity, a lot of pipeline in the IPOs. Uh, I think you should see a lot more in 2021. Um, 2020, of course, the activity was driven more by the retail money and, and liquidity driven, but uh, 2021 should revert to more fundamentals. Um, but the big thrust for the government is also on the debt side. It has been stated by the Ministry of Finance, it has been stated very clearly by CMA that uh, the debt and debt instruments would be, uh, would be the focus of the next round of focus for development. Uh, you would have seen already that foreigners are now able to invest in listed and non-listed debt developments, which should continue this thrust. Um, so I think uh, watch out for that particular space because um, Saudi capital market is already is already quite deep in the equities. And again, just as a factoid, um, the if I got my math correct, the Indian stock market between BSE and NSE uh, churned something like $12 billion a, a day. Um, the Saudi capital market, which is the biggest in the region, in the Minat region, is uh, churns about $4 billion a day. So for a country that is just 30 million people compared to 1.3 in, in India, uh, that's not a bad liquidity or size uh, to be able to offer. So continue watching the developments in the capital market, which have taken place at a very, very strong basis. Um, and uh, to continue even further, I think further confidence has also been provided by cracking down on the malpractices, um, insider trading and having a robust AML system, which is leading to greater confidence in the system. So uh, broadly, I mean, I just finished off by saying, um, we do expect to see a better 2021, obviously, but the banking and broader financial system should be able to ready to support this uptake. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, you well narrated how financial market is moving, and one of the worry which every business was having, you know, banks are saying they are full of liquidity, but they are uh, cautious. You very well explained. I'm just taking your point on infrastructure. So let me just uh, move your discussion to our next panelist, Mr. Rahul Goswami. Rahul carries, uh, he's working with uh, Keystone as partner in Middle East. Uh, he has been very good uh, working knowledge on infrastructure, power and utilities, including renewables, uh, PPP mode uh, uh, support to business projects. So let us hear from him, uh, Rahul, what are the key trends in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, infrastructure project and project financing, and how will the budget have positive impact on such projects, which some of our friends uh, from the student discussion take it forward. Yes. Uh, thank you, Bijay, for this uh, opportunity. As always, it is a wonderful uh, to be associated with uh, SIBN as I have been for the past so many years. Though practically I'm based in Dubai, most of my projects are based in Saudi. So uh, just a few clarification points uh, in relation to some of the points raised by Dr. Pradeep and Dr. Mohandas Pai. So we are seeing renewed investments in Saudi. Uh, in relation to pharmaceuticals, we are in the process of setting up a uh, big pharma plant in the King Abdullah Economic City by one of the pharma giants. So in, in the utility sector, uh, as you might be knowing, the first uh, solar project, uh, the Sakaka project, the EPC contractor was an Indian contractor. So they completed it. And now the project is connected to the grid. So that's a, uh, that's a feather in the... And we have uh, also from Saudi Arabia, as people might be remembering, there's a lot of PIF uh, investment in the Reliance platform. So uh, around 1.3 billion you know, dollars have been in invested. So there is a lot of synergy. And uh, very interestingly, uh, because of this synergy, we are seeing a lot of uh, interest uh, from Middle Eastern, Eastern developers to invest in utility assets in India. So we are in the process of doing some due diligence for certain com Middle Eastern companies for utility assets, especially solar assets in India. 
so i think there is a bit of synergy by this big uh, you know uh, influx of capital on both sides so what needs to be done is to maintain this synergy over a period of time so that we can see productive growth so coming to the uh, so coming to the key takeaways uh, from the infrastructure you know uh, and and project financing uh, arena so what we have been seeing is from the past 20 years we are seeing a uh, uh, renewed uh, you know uh, development in the power and electricity sector in the ppp arena so this has been highly successful uh, the models have been uh, replicated and again and again so from this uh, success story the saudi government is jumping to other sectors of ppp namely uh, ppp in the transport sectors we are seeing increased uh, involvement of the government procurers in uh, the land based projects the metro projects and several port projects in saudi arabia so that's a upcoming sector and recently also we have seen a number of pp in the ppp projects in the social infrastructure space namely the healthcare sector uh, the education sector and the housing sector if just close the tbc schools project which is uh, as doc, as mr sukla has mentioned 60 schools uh, allocating around 50000 students and uh, this will be operated by a private developer for around 20 years so this is a new uh, area and and uh, healthcare is a new area there there are certain ppp projects going on healthcare sector king fajr specialty hospital ppp projects is on way and there are uh, opportunities for several other ppp projects in that uh, arena so we are seeing increase uh, having uh, uh, success uh, the success story of the power and water sector is being replicated in the other sectors namely uh, the transportation sectors the healthcare sectors the education sector and the housing sector uh, in in addition to this we are seeing a new trend where uh, there is a lot of movement in government procurers you know disposing some of the non core assets uh, in terms of power utilities and petrochemicals and they they, they want to give it uh, such investments uh, as they want to capitalize somewhere else or simply there is a technological gap and they want the technical experts and some Uh, well-known private equity players to take up that that position. So we are seeing a lot of uh, development and synergy in that. And these are existing brownfield projects which have been uh, going on for certain times. Just that the government procurer or the entities are now coming out of the project and reinvesting uh, that uh, money in some other uh, arena. or their core competencies so uh, these are not purely what we are calling a, a capital blend uh, you know uh, process there might be in certain cases because if you see certain plants uh, are aging they would need certain capex enhancement also in terms of their efficiencies and other uh, you know output so uh, a recent example of such an you know project was the zizan gas projects of aramco which was uh, taken over by air products and neom and roughly the 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 valuation of the projects is around about uh, 12 billion uh, us dollars so uh, this was one of the start and i think there are a lot of such projects in the pipeline where uh the, the the government players want the private sectors to come in and invest with a technical you know experts on board and this would be this is significant because those are these are huge projects and they would require a huge bite size investment from the big players it would not be the normal developers who would be having the capacity to invest in such projects so we would need, need the likes of the kkrs and the black box to come and invest in such huge projects and uh, this will also uh, enhance the fdi portfolio of the kingdom and bringing in the max uh, required uh, technological advantages also so we as a key 
element in, in, in the project sector. And the other key element and the final element that we're looking at the project sector is the diversification of the petrochemical and the refinery projects to the downstream, uh, uh, you know, specialty petrochemicals. So there has been a significant increase in such diversification over the last years, but this has been expedited by the COVID and the low oil prices. So uh, for instance, Aramco and uh, Sabik have uh, uh, added momentum to their, you know, the strategic direction of uh, producing special chemi chemical, uh, uh, you know, products and specialty chemical products. So roughly, for instance, between 2015 and 2019, Saudi Arabia's chemical, you know, uh, uh, product range have increased around about 66% uh, uh, compared to uh, uh, the previous period. So we are seeing a lot of uh, refineries being reconfigured to, to deploy downstream uh, outputs, specialty chemical products. And uh, in the long run, we are seeing that the whole part of the crude refining is going to transform into a more uh, you know, uh, productive uh, long-term uh, portfolio of specialty chemical where the barrel would fits around about 40 to 30% of the income through the specialty products. So these are my key, uh, you know, trends uh, that I have noticed in the, in the Saudi economy over a period of time. And uh, now over to Bijay for uh, uh, other speakers. Thank you, Rahul. You have given very big insight of what new projects are coming up. And we were just talking to one of colleagues who are bidding for a government project on PPP mode, whether it is school, hospital. So government is coming in various regions. You know, they are looking for such kind of bidding. Of course, I'm seeing limited uh, players from India. And I hope that with your support, you can uh, inspire them, come and do collaboration. Because wherever we have advantage, Let's your business community basically adds value and they make money. So there is nothing wrong in that, but we have to support that. Thank you, Rahul. Yes. Uh, let's go to Anindya, uh, my colleague, again, SIBN member. Uh, now he's based in India with PwC. So I, Anindya, you must be hearing us a lot uh, throughout the day. Can you tell us how uh, Saudi... Uh, oil pricing is going to impact us and any other uh, key takeaway you would like to mention here on India. Sure, Vijay. Uh, first of all, I, I can clearly see that we have overshot our time. So I'll keep it sweet and short and won't, you know, bore other members who are there on the panel as well as, you know, listening members. Uh, just to give a perspective of uh, what oil demand comes from, 40% of oil demand actually comes from transportation of intra within uh, the state, within the country, which is called, you know, Raji road transportation. Another 40% comes from transportation within countries, which is largely ship and uh, aircrafts. 20% uh, largely comes from, uh, I'll say from, you know, largely petrochemicals. This was the scenario about five years back. What has changed significantly is that the demand of oil from petrochemicals, as Rahul is saying, has shot up significantly, largely because of speciality chemicals. On the transportation part within the city, this is where we are seeing the demand either stagnating or it's coming down. Uh, there are various reports which says that demand has already stagnated on the transport part. It will increase to about, say, 2.5 million barrels per day. I will give you numbers in perspective. Uh, this used to be around 5 million barrels per day sometime, you know, five, maybe 4 or 5 years back or maybe 10 years back. The demand of oil in 2019 was around 100 million barrels. Currently, it's about 91.3 million barrels. And it is expected that in next year, this would be about close to 98 million barrels. Now, this 7 million barrels, which is increasing, is largely the cut that all the OPEC members have induced upon themselves. Which means next year when uh, uh, the economy recovers, we expect that whatever cut all the OPEC members have done, they will kind of, you know, they don't need to do the kind of a cut. And hence, there will be a demand to supply mismatch. Uh, that will go away. 
What it does not take into account is that there are three countries like Iran, Libya, and Venezuela, which is unable to tap to 3.5 million barrels of oil, additional oil, either because of sanctions or other issues. Uh, prominent among them is Iran. It is expected that with now Joe Biden coming in US, Iran deal will probably, some of the embargo will go away. Iran will start pumping in oil. So what does it mean for Saudi Arabia? Next year, when all the demand supply will mismatch, the other headache it will have is Iran trying to pump in close to what is expected about you know 1.5 million barrels per day extra. That 1.5 million barrels effectively means the demand supply imbalance will further in, increase to one or two more years. So from 2021, this will go to somewhere like 2023, where even if Iran starts pumping in, and God knows when Venezuela will pump in, Iran and Libya coming in, largely the demand supply mismatch will again go away. So what I'm trying to say is that next year, yes, the we won't see the oil prices coming down for sure. Once the Iran deal comes in, because of this geopolitical shock, there will be a slight dip, but again, that will get balanced by, say, 2023 or so. Post that, the oil demand is expected to increase by about 1 million barrels per day. While it's not clear whether U.S. shale gas has capacity to increase from currently 18 million barrels to 19 or 20 year on year, there are a lot of reports that say that probably U.S. is already plateauing on whatever capacities it has. Hence, 2023, 2024 onwards, whenever you know uh, the demand for the picks up, we do expect the oil prices to go up further. Will it go to 100 million, uh, 100 dollars? Nobody knows. Will it st re uh, remain ranged one for the next one to two years? Definitely. So the worst is definitely behind us when it comes to oil prices. The demand or the characteristics of this oil will change. It will not come from transport. It will come from, I'll say, petrochemicals. That's where the growth is. And that is why you will see in Saudi Arabia, the focus has completely shifted from upstream to rather than downstream. And that's evident across the globe as well, especially in countries like China. Over to you, Vijay. Thank you, Anindya. You have given very short and sweet, uh, but your message is basically next two years, you don't see much uh, changes in the current oil pricing. Uh, with that, I will just pass on to uh, Madam Hamna Mariam to say a few words and take it over. Thank you, Mr. Soni. Uh, greetings to all of you from the Consulate General of India, Jeddah. First and foremost, I thank Mr. Mohindas Pai in his absence, an eponymous name in the digital space. Mr. S Mr. Pai spoke about reconfiguration of businesses, streamlining companies, ushering in digital revolution. He stressed on global tech being the new normal. The Embassy of India, Riyadh, and the Consulate General of India, Jeddah, has taken cognizance of this digital partnership and along with Saudi Indian Business Network, we are going to roll out a major event on digital tech with NASCOM and CIO Forum as our partners. I thank the president of SIB and Jeddah chapter, Mr. Mazin Batterji, for constantly supporting the endeavor to have closer collaboration in the bilateral growth story. I thank Mr. Raghav Kullar, the head of finance sector of Saudi Indian Business Network, Jeddah chapter, for a holistic presentation on the 2021 budget. I thank the previous Deputy Chief of Mission in Embassy of India, Riyadh, and Director Beamstech and Sark, Dr. Pradeep Rajpurohit, for giving a political and commercial overview between the two countries. He also mentioned regarding the limited Saudi investment in India, which is an area where further work is to be done. I thank Mr. Schroeder for throwing light on VAT. He has done an exclusive session on VAT, which is available on our SIBN website, sibnksa.com, and SIBN's YouTube channel. I thank Mr. Vijay Mehta for stressing on financial markets and how it would be beneficial for both the countries and the world itself if we have financial co collaboration between both the countries. More value was added to this point when Mr. Shukla said the market has catapulted, quote unquote, to be in the top 10. 
My thanks are due to Mr. Rajiv Shukla, CEO HSBC, signaling a positive outlook for 2021 and for driving the point of money remaining in the kingdom, increasing the spending within the borders. I thank Mr. Rahul Goswami for stressing on PPP projects in wide array of sectors. I also thank Mr. Anandya for bringing in geopolitics and economics of oil, smoothening the demand supply mispatch in the years to come. I thank Mr. Vijay Soni, General Secretary of SIB in Jeddah Chapter, for spearheading this event. Without doubt, this has been a huge value addition for all of us who attended this event. Mr. Soni, may your tribe increase. Lastly, thank you all for attending the event. We hope to see you in our events to come. Season greetings to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.